This is CBC Here and Now. You cannot, under any circumstances, trust this industry. The magnitude of this disaster is almost beyond comprehension. Tonight, continued calls for better oversight and accusations the aquaculture industry has no accountability. This after a company with 2.6 million dead fish reveals it also had a disease problem. And... I want to let you know we found your husband. My two arms, I must have a thousand mosquito bites. Six years ago, he went missing while picking berries and police investigated his wife in his disappearance. Tonight, Chess and Florence Sweet Apple tell us about their ordeal in our special series, This Is My Story. Good evening and welcome to Here and Now. I'm Anthony Germain. The company at the center of a massive fish die off on the south coast is once again on the defensive. As we first reported last night, disease was present in some fish cages this summer, but Northern Harvest Sea Farms did not reveal that during a news conference in which the company apologized for being less than forthcoming about the volume of dead fish. And as Here and Now's Terry Roberts reports tonight, this has given critics yet another reason to distrust the industry. This industry is characterized by deceit, deception, misleading statements. Leo White says this revelation is further proof that aquaculture companies like Northern Harvest need to be reined in. We're not trying to eliminate the aquaculture industry. You know, we recognize that it could be, it can create viable jobs you know, in places in Newfoundland where they are desperately needed. But it has to be regulated properly. It can't be regulated to let the industry do what they, what they like. And that's the way it's been. Like, they, they're accountable to no one. White was reacting to a revelation on Tuesday that infectious salmon anemia, or ISA, was detected at some northern harvest sites this summer. The information was made public by the federal agency that is responsible for the health and safety of Canada's food supply. The company confirmed that it was forced to harvest 126,000 fish this summer as a precautionary measure. But none of this was mentioned at this news conference on Friday. What it tells me is that you cannot, under any circumstances, trust this industry. Northern Harvest is denying the two disease outbreaks played a role in a disaster that left 2.6 million salmon dead and insists that unusually high water temperatures are to blame. The company was not doing interviews today, but posted this statement to its Facebook page. The temperature event that took place in late August that led to the mass mortality happened well after the ISA fish in question were sampled. Fisheries Minister Jerry Byrne spent the long weekend on the south coast, meeting with worried aquaculture workers and community leaders, but has declined repeated interview requests from the CBC. On Friday, Byrne announced he was temporarily suspending the licenses for 10 northern harvest sites for what he called non-compliance. He also said Memorial University would lead a review of the fish die-off, but that has not satisfied the critics. We need a public review similar to an inquiry. It has to be done under some authority like the Public Inquiries Act. It has to have the resources and the capability and the uh, Authority, that's the word. You know, you, you can't do an inquiry like this unless you have authority. Meanwhile, the company says the loss of so many fish from warm water was never previously conceived, and it plans to make changes to ensure it doesn't happen again. Terry Roberts, CBC News, St. John's. Well, meanwhile, a Norwegian expert in aquaculture says the industry needs oversight. Dag Sletmo, an aquaculture analyst for Norway's leading bank, spoke today with Jane Aidy from CBC Radio's The Broadcast, and he says aquaculture is like many other major industries that have regulatory bodies, and he says companies working here should also be open and transparent to the public. I think the starting point is that aquaculture needs to be uh, strictly regulated. It's uh, just like the finance industry. Some industries, if they're left to their own devices, will create crazy uh, uh, boom and bust. So that's something we've seen in aquaculture. If it's people are free to do whatever they do, uh, want, they don't take care of the biosecurity, they get a lot of disease, and it becomes a financial disaster. Now you can listen to Jane's full interview on the broadcast anytime, on demand. Just download the CBC Listen app for free and search for the latest show, or you can go to the website, cbc.ca slash listen. 
A necropsy has started on an adult male killer whale that was accidentally caught in a gill net a couple of weeks ago. The orca became entangled near Beaumont in Notre Dame Bay, and a fisherman towed that whale into a wharf, so a team of scientists were able to quickly respond and study the whale, and we were there today as they studied the creature, but a warning, some of what you're about to see is graphic. I'm Jack Lawson. I'm a research scientist here at Fisheries and Oceans in St. John's, Newfoundland. On the 2nd of October, uh, we got a report that a fisherman had caught a uh, killer whale in a gill net uh, just north of Beaumont on the north coast in Notre Dame Bay. We have a dorsal fin from this animal. We have the rather large skull here. And over in the bucket, we have a set of intestines that were collected from inside the animal that we're going to look at this morning. It's very sad to see a large adult uh, animal like this die in a gill net because you can imagine it's an air-breathing animal like us. So this animal would have drowned in the net. And in fact, when they did the necropsy, they found water in the lungs. The advantage to us of being able to have an animal like this is that it was a fresh animal. We know how it died and it's going to provide samples of a species that we don't often get a chance to look at. A tour group in Trinity Bay a few weeks earlier took a picture of a pod of animals that had a sub-adult male like this in it, and it looks to me like a couple of the scrapes that were photographed on the body then matched the scrapes on the animal here, so we might actually know what group this animal was in. We have an, a skull of this animal that was taken off of the corpse, uh, and what we're going to do from this is collect a teaching specimen, so we will take all of the flesh that you see on the outside of here, the melon, the brains, take everything off and just have nice clean white bones to present for Ocean's Day in the future, but also to measure for the size of the animal. We'll be able to take a tooth out, cut a section through it, and like a tree, when a lot of these cetaceans with teeth grow older, they lay down rings in their teeth. And you can cut a section through it and look at that and the count the rings will give you the age of the animal or an approximate age. And for an animal like this, we have a couple of things working against us. One is that they only eat periodically. So unlike us that kind of chew all through the day, these animals might go a day or two without eating. So often their stomachs are empty. Secondly, a lot of cetaceans, when they get caught in gear and start to drown, they'll vomit up what's in their stomach. By looking at the intestines, you see a part of the, their previous meals and it also is not going to be voided by the time I get to do a necropsy. So what I'm hoping to find in the intestines today is maybe remains of fish or maybe fingernails from seals or teeth from dolphins. We just don't know. So it's a bit like a Christmas gift, if you will, that we won't know until we unwrap it what's inside. It's uh, lucky that television does not yet have olfactory <laughs> smell o vision yet. The amazing thing about killer whales and other marine mammals from the time they ate a herring to the time they produced a scat sample at the other end could be four to six hours. So they process food very quickly. I don't even see any nematodes. Wow, Another any thing we're looking for huh? is parasites. So if you look at the gut say of a gray seal on Sable Island they have a lot of codworm in their stomachs and it passes right through the gut. So in fact, we did a stomach once on a Gracie and an adult that had eight kilograms of worms in the stomach and the guts. So there's a you small piece that. of plastic wrapper found in the gut. So that's something he could have ingested, just have a mouth opener feeding on something. And we know that these animals have been seen killing minke whales. I've got some great photographs of pairs of killer whales with white beaked dolphins between them, escorting them to their final dinner appointment. We've seen animals on the south coast that have killed minke whales and then brought the dorsal fin over and offered it to people nearby in boats because they like to share their food. So we're estimating probably a couple of hundred animals in the waters extending from the Labrador to the northeast U.S. So they're very rare in the northeast U.S. They see one or two a year, same in Nova Scotia. They're rare in the Gulf now, but Newfoundland Labrador seems to be the place on the northwest Atlantic for killer whales here. And it may be because we have so many marine mammals here for them to feed on. Well, I think the distribution of these animals is changing partially because up to the Second World War, they were an animal that was killed. They were also whaled, so, and they still are in West Greenland. They, they hunt them for food there. And so there was removals that took the population to quite a low level. Their numbers were reduced in the Northwest Atlantic, and I think yeah. we're seeing a recovery. So we see lots of calves when we're out there, and that could be why there's seemingly more and more. And as well, I think social media, you know, we have a Tell Jack campaign where people are sending me photographs all the time when they're out on tour boats. And so I think just everybody has a cell phone now and is able to get great imagery. <laughs> Well, if that story turned your stomach, don't worry. I've got a lot of fresh air on the way for you uh, tonight, especially that uh, system that we talked about yesterday is moved offshore now. Some clearing skies happen this afternoon, 
But our next weather maker is starting to take shape. We've got a low over Ontario and just off the coast of the states. They're going to merge tonight and strengthen and head towards the maritime provinces overnight tonight and then eventually make its way towards us as we head into Thursday and Friday with some rain warnings or rather uh, heavy rain in the way on the way and some wind warnings. I'll have all the details coming up. Well, time now to check in with our Carolyn Stokes, who's at the Avalon Mall tonight. Uh, not shopping, not there for the next big Marvel movie. Tonight, it's all about the locals. Carolyn. Yes, Anthony, the red carpet is all rolled out for the beginning of the St. John's International Women's Film Festival. It's the start of a five-day celebration of women and film, but it's also a milestone. It's the 30th anniversary of the festival, and you know, 30 years is a really long time. 30 years ago, Clyde Wells was premier of the province. Rod Stewart played that huge concert on the shores of Kitty Vitty Lake and uh, Batman, the movie, you know, the one with Michael Keaton and Jack Nicholson. Well, that was the summer blockbuster. And Millie Vanilli was at the height of their fame. So, yes, a lot has changed since then, but not the need for a female focused festival. And that's what's happening here tonight. Coming up on Here and Now, I'll speak with one of the organizers of the festival and meet the woman behind the premiere a movie airing tonight, Black Conflux. Back to you, Anthony. Thanks, Carol. Well, now to a case of road rage to report. A man has been charged for allegedly striking a flags person on purpose. It happened Tuesday morning on Water Street in Carboneer. Police say a 55-year-old driver became irate when the traffic was stopped for construction. And police say the man intentionally struck a flags person with his vehicle and then fled the scene. The Carboneer man has been charged with assault with a weapon as well as other offenses under the Highway Traffic Act. The flag person was taken to hospital with some minor injuries. Well, seven people are lucky to be alive after a fast moving fire ripped through a home in Fox Trap last night. CBS fire crews arrived at the house shortly after 1045 and they faced difficult conditions, extremely heavy smoke and poor visibility. Two adults and four small children, they escaped from the main part of the home while another adult managed to flee a basement apartment. Sadly, the family's pet dog died in the fire. The fire chief says smoke detectors alerted the family about the blaze. The RNC is investigating. A group that helps young people who are exploited sexually is getting some financial help. The provincial government has handed over more than $60,000 to help them with their work. The money will raise awareness of the degree to which youth are sexually exploited and it's going to be done by the Coalition Against the Sexual Exploitation of Youth, which is part of that community group Thrive. Until now, the Coalition could never afford to assign someone to that work. We've collectively been doing this off the side of our desk with no money, so now we have a full-time coordinator who is a person with lived experience. We actually have funding to support survivor leadership and survivor training. We have funding to offer youth prevention programs, so it really allows us the resources to do the work on the ground. Well, the ongoing massage parlor issue in the city of St. John's has taken another interesting turn. Council is looking to change the name from massage parlor to body rub parlor. Councillor Maggie Burton presented a proposal from city staff about the name change at last night's weekly meeting at City Hall. Staff had proposed uh, that we in advance change the wording from massage parlor to body rub parlor in the draft development regulations. Um, and instead of making that change ourselves, I thought it would be more fitting to have a discussion with more of our stakeholders. We've received a lot of concerns uh, from registered massage therapists and the mayor is meeting with them this week to discuss. So we can, um, we can have those discussions about what to change the name to should we change it, but I think it should include all uh, voices in that conversation. Well, Burton says some sex workers she spoke with aren't happy with the new name either. The city does want to hear from the public and will be holding a meeting on November the 6th and written submissions will also be accepted. Well, staying with the city of St. John's, the city is installing flashing crosswalk signals at Rollins Cross. That decision comes little more than a year into a pilot project that saw the complicated St. John's intersection turned into a roundabout. Now, people who want to cross the street will activate the flashing signals. Right now, pedestrians have to wait for traffic to stop before they can actually cross. 
The roundabout is still only a pilot project, but the flashing beacons will become permanent if the roundabout stays. Council made the decision to put in the new signals after hearing from people who walk in the area. The impetus was not because it was dangerous, it was because from the people that were, uh, the, the information we got from the public and from our own studies, we felt that it would make the area safer. It's not that the area was t dangerous as it was, but uh, you know, to enhance safety is one of the major uh, goals of our city transportation engineer and our master plan. So it was to make it more alert. Black Complex is this unconventional coming-of-age tale that follows two characters. The accent for Newfoundland was tricky, but the younger generation doesn't really have such a thick accent. The film Black Conflux shows tonight at the opening of the 30th St. John's International Women's Film Festival. Coming up, Carolyn will talk to the film's director, but first, she's going to take a look at the importance of the film festival as it celebrates 30 years. That's nice. Oh, so you got your own fan club there, uh, <laughs> Ashley. That's pretty cool. Yeah, 
Yeah. So you're, were you out there? Obviously you were. I was. Paradise. Yeah. Paradise Elementary. In Paradise Elementary. We had a little uh, weather chat this afternoon oh, yeah. in conjunction with their weather unit. Grade fives, hundred and something students. A lot of kids in that Lots shop right kids. there. Lots of kids. Excellent. Yeah. yeah, it was Very lovely. Good. Very knowledgeable asking, again, so many weather questions and quite a few great ones too, oh, actually. Good. good. <laughs> yeah. So where do you want to start? Uh, why don't we start where it was a little bit white this morning? Okay. We woke up to uh, a little bit more than a dusting for Lab West. <laughs> Take a look, Wabush. Uh, Kirk King sent us this photo. Not everybody doesn't like the snow. He looks happy. Cameron loves it. At least it looks like he loves it. The first one is lovable. It's true. <laughs> the first one's okay. It's, it's the one. It's the next that 200 that kind of gets exactly. you. Exactly. That's that's what gets to you for sure. But uh, yeah, definitely a cool morning. As you can see, he's all bundled up. Minus one this morning to start uh, in Lab City. Happy Valley Goose Bay around zero degrees. Most of us were relatively mild uh, in the six to seven degree range, a little warmer in Burgio this morning. And those temperatures really climbed this afternoon into the uh, mid to low or low to mid teens for uh, most of us. 14 degrees was actually the hot spot, St. John's and uh, eight degrees in Happy Valley Goose Bay. Now uh, this uh, afternoon we did see the sky's clear for the most part. We're starting to lose that daylight. So the visible satellite now, uh, <laughs> further and further we get towards winter, uh, the darker or the lighter it gets rather. So if we zoom out a little bit, you can see that our next weather maker is on the way. So these are a couple of low pressure systems that are gonna merge tonight and intensify as they head towards uh, parts of the uh, Maritimes. But high pressure right now is dominating. So that's what's gonna be our, uh, the majority of our weather tonight, which means nothing. So it should be fairly clear overnight tonight. Those temperatures though are going to dip, especially in those low lying areas. You're looking at temperatures uh, likely near or just below zero. So you might wanna leave a couple of minutes in the morning just in case you have to scrape off some froth. Northerly winds, but 20 to 40 kilometers per hour, uh, four degrees for St. John's, three degrees for St. Anthony. Uh, up through Labrador, slight chance of some shower or uh, flurries rather will continue for Lab City, minus two. Those winds will be generally light and then either showers or flurries tonight for Nain, two degrees. Otherwise, we're looking at fair skies overnight tonight, anywhere from three to five degrees as you head towards the coast. Now, tomorrow, that's when those winds really pick up as that low pressure system starts to make its way uh, towards the island. Certainly into the afternoon, those winds will really pick up down through the southern half of, or at least the southwestern part of the island. You're looking at gusts uh, around 70 to upwards of 100 kilometers per hour, and then even more so into the evening hours. We could see, especially for the rec house area, upwards of 130 kilometer per hour gusts or more. And then we could see 100 kilometer per hour winds. Uh, those places that are, are normally uh, going to see those easterly winds with those stronger winds uh, expected to make their way towards the eastern portions of the island as we head into overnight and Friday morning. So as far as uh, those wind warnings go, all the way up through to Gross Morn, and then we have a special weather statement in effect for the eastern portions of uh, the Avalon. So tomorrow, here comes all that cloud cover. We'll likely see that cloud increase through the first half of the day. The rain will move in late day for southwestern and then spread across the island overnight. And as much as uh, 30 to 50 millimeters is possible right now for the eastern portion of the Avalon. So as far as those temperatures go, again, we should see increasing clouds. So the first half of the day under that high pressure, not too bad. 10 degrees for St. John's, 11 for Clarenville as you head towards central. 12 to 13 degrees it looks like. And then again, that rain moving in for the south coast. Port of Basque and Burgio looking at rain uh, through the day. St. Anthony, 10 degrees. And then up through Cartwright, same thing. And then uh, hanging on to that chance of flurries for Lab City, unfortunately, five degrees and plenty of sunshine for Nain. So that's a look at your forecast. We'll uh, kind of time out what's going to happen over the next couple of days when I come back. Right, thanks, Ashley. Let's uh, check back in with Carolyn Stokes now, who's live at the opening night gala for the St. John's International Women's Film Festival. Carolyn. 
Yes, Anthony, lots of people starting to show up here at the Avalon Mall where the uh, feature film Black Con Flux is, is going to be the first movie uh, to start off the St. John's International Women's Film Festival. You can see behind me some actors getting uh, their photo taken, all that kind of stuff happening. And joining me now to talk more about the festival is Executive Director uh, Jen Brown. So happy 30th birthday. How does it feel for the festival to turn the big 3-0? It's huge. It's really exciting. Yeah, we're thrilled. There's so many people in town, and as you can see, it's a uh, yeah, really full of incredibly energetic, excited people, and we're really excited to screen this film soon. And not only is it the 30th anniversary, but the festival also has the distinction of being the second longest running <laughs> festival in the world. So why do you think this province was ahead of the curve back then? I think uh, no one's surprised if you meet any of our local artists or and also our community members. You know, across the board, we have this incredibly diverse, multidisciplinary group of uh, artists and our community here. You know, Newfoundlanders are known for being storytellers and so supportive and encouraging in our hospitality. Uh, our creativity. Um, plus, you know, you get to come to Newfoundland. We're this little rock in the middle of the North Atlantic. If you're into hiking or food or music or visual arts or, you know, you name it, it's here. So it's really magical. And once people come here and they meet local people and local artists and filmmakers and just experience the whole province, they're in love. And uh, yeah, after 30 years, that's why they keep coming back. <laughs> yeah, and are you noticing more people coming to the festival this year because it's the 30th anniversary and also uh, ABC in the States had that report saying uh, this was one of the top 10 festivals to travel to. That must have been a pretty big boost for the festival as well. Yes, certainly. I mean, our numbers have been rising every single year. Uh, we keep selling out all of our events. We keep getting more and more new faces. And really, yeah, being voted as one of the best 10 festivals in the world worth traveling for. Um, it's yeah, I agree, we are. And uh, it's certainly a lot of people getting their attention who uh, aren't necessarily in the industry, but they're film lovers and they're also tourists and they want to come here and we are the perfect reason for them to come in that shoulder season as well. So what can festival goers expect over the next five days? Five days full of amazing film screens, both local features and shorts, films from all over the world, film panels, parties, workshops, happy hours at the hall, you name it, we really do have something for everyone. And you know, this is a women's film festival. There was a reason that a, a women's film festival was created 30 years ago. How, what has changed in that time for women and film? Um, I mean, we are really fortunate to be seeing some progression and some movements, the conversations happening. I mean, that's something that this festival really exists for, to bring up the awareness and the education about how greatly uh, lacking gender diversity and inclusion really is in our industry. It's improving slowly, but really it's also about how to celebrate women's work, how to celebrate women's storytellers, and uh, Canadian film in general. A lot of people don't realize how important it is to come out and support Canadian films and filmmakers, especially that first weekend, and we give people an opportunity to come and do that. That. Okay, well, lots of celebrating happening over the next five days for sure. Jen Brown, thank you so thank much you for so speaking much. with me and coming up on here and now. I'm going to speak with uh, the woman behind uh, the movie that's playing tonight, A Black Conflux. Reporting live from the Avalon Mall, I'm Carolyn Stokes for here and now. Well, I heard I was a diabetic with no pills, and I knew if I had something sweet, the, the sugars in the bake apples kept me from going low. A harrowing excursion. He went out to pick berries and was lost in the woods for a week. Chess Sweet Apple shares new details of his story. That's ahead.
Welcome back to Here Now. In 2013, we brought you a remarkable story about a lost berry picker. Chess Sweet Apple was searching for bake apples in central Newfoundland when he got lost in the woods. Seven days, no sign of Chess. His wife Florence and their son Dave, well, they were preparing for the worst. And then the phone rang and he'd been found. Here's Chess Sweet Apple talking about what happened when he got home from hospital just a few weeks later. Went upstream, thought I was going to head to a pond that I knew, towards my friend's cabin. But I was on the right-hand side of the road, which these are two ponds that I am not familiar. The other ponds are no them So I walked in times, I was up to my knees in water, and times I was up to here. And I said, don't go in the woods, because if I went in the woods, they may never find me. So I stayed on that bog. Fear never, ever registered in my mind. Never. You know, there's nothing ever crossed me like they're never going to find me, I'm going to die. Never crossed my mind. Never. Obviously an emotional time right after Chess's rescue. So now, as part of Here Now special series, This Is My Story, we're checking back in with the Sweet Apples, and this time around, they offer different details about that ordeal, including a suspected murder investigation. Well, I went up to my cabin on a Friday with the intention of just going to check out this bog to see if there was any bake apples on it. It got a little dark and I decided to take a shortcut through the wood. He was submerged in water for the whole week. My hair was a diabetic with no pills. Florence Sweetapple didn't think she'd ever see her husband Chess alive again. Hi, I'm Chess. Hi, I'm Flo. Six years ago, I went missing while picking berries in Millertown and this is my story. 74-year-old St. John's man has been missing for a week after he didn't return from a berry picking trip. When I went into the bog, it was orange. So I had a Ziploc bag and I just started picking and picking and picking. And I guess it got a little dark and I uh, decided to take a shortcut through the woods, which I've done numerous times. But anyway, it didn't work up that way, so I spent the night on the bog, just over the bog where I was picking. And the next morning, my intentions was to walk down this woods road to where my truck was. He was walking, he was telling me all about this, and he was walking around this pond, and it was a flat rock, and he stepped on it, and he zoomed right out in the pond, if it went. And he had to swim in and get back up again. My two arms, I had must have a thousand mosquito bites. I had a Heli Henson jacket. Sometimes I put that over me. Sometimes if the water was too, I laid down in the bag. My hair was a diabetic with no pills. And I knew if I had something sweet, the, the sugars in the bake apples kept me from going low. And I had this little cup and I used to drink that bog water and that's what kept me going. I think it's about the third day I must have just took a diabetic coma, passed out. He always called me when he'd get there, and he didn't. And uh, so I was calling them all that night, and I kept getting a recording. Uh, the person you were trying to reach is either outside or has their phone turned off. So I called my friend. She said, well, my husband and I, and I will take a run up to look for him. So when she went to the cabin, she, and she called me in her cell, she said, all your sheds are open, but the, your cabin is locked. I said, put a little note on the door for me and, and say, you better call Florence because she's going to murder you. And the Mounties found a note. So now it's a crime scene. Our cabin and our truck was all roped off as a crime scene. Now that's only a figure of speech. Anyway, I had the Mounties here for two days with me and they asked me all kinds of questions. And on the second day, he realized no, there was no problems. Then we left it at that. They were supposed to be looking for chess, but the Mounties were told that he never went down this bog. They gave up looking. And now my son was overseas. And I didn't want to go letting him know about this. And when he came back and he got a hold of the Mounties, he said, get in and look for my father. Well, I was after walking about a mile and a half up a pond after the third day, I, I was probably getting a little delusion, of, so I didn't, I didn't see or hear anything. The seventh morning they came in, and they had the mayor of Millertown, 
And as they were searching all around, they moved up where I was. And they're on their way out again, and Mr. Green, he walked over to me and he said, Chess, we got you, we got you. And my words to him was, what took you so long to find me? I use an expletive, but I won't say that here. What was it like to get that phone call? Oh, my son sat there, and I sat in my chair, and we were talking about, he said, now, Mom, this is seven days, so you got to make up your mind what you're going to do. And with that, the phone rang. It was the Mounties in Grand Falls. And he said, Florence, I want to let you know we found your husband. I froze. I didn't say nothing. I waited for him to tell me what was wrong. And he said, uh, he's alive. And my, my son jumped up and he grabbed me. I, I, I say he could hear me in Grand Falls. Oh, it was emotional. Especially when you bring up, you know, when she just, it was bad then, but uh, no, it, it was, it was uh, very emotional. I got to have faith in God, and he made it. After the, the ordeal up in the woods, we, I come back and I, we drove up to the cabin. I said, just well, get rid of it. Now, when we went out and closed the door, we never looked back. We just went, kept going. By well, now we got the house in Florida. So we go every November? It's beautiful. I mean, I just love it down there. I mean, every day the sun shines. Well, I'm out in the garden all day long. All day long. We got some nice tropical bushes and cactus. And three big palm trees in. We got it pretty tropical looking. That's his life. That's what he loves doing. We do a lot of visiting down there. We go to, we got friends in Anna Maria Island. We go down and spend a week with them. And, and down in St. Pete, we got nice friends down there. Thank you. I had a stroke the winter. Oh my gosh, what a, what a going over I got. Was she off her, off her nest, huh? It was a hard time. I went through a hard time. Mm -hmm. Every doctor that I had could not believe that I never got no side effects. And I said, oh, you think so? I'm a miracle. I said, do you want to hear his story? Do you still do your pick today? No. He, he, he definitely don't pick me. No, I, I don't do pick and berries anymore. No. Just a little babies down there, no? Yeah. What would you say to someone now today who says they're going to go out berry picking? Go pick them. Just go pick them. But take your cell phone with you, too. And turn it on. Well, he might not be picking berries anymore, but Chess Sweetapple is still an avid outdoorsman. And just last week, he was back in Central, hanging out at some friends' cabins. And now the couple is busy getting ready to head back to Florida. If you're enjoying our special Here and Now series, This Is My Story, stay tuned. We'll have another segment for you in two weeks. Thirty years and counting, the St. John's International Women's Film Festival is celebrating a milestone anniversary. I'm live at the opening night gala, and coming up on Here and Now, I'll speak with the writer and director of tonight's feature film, Black Conflux.
Welcome back to Here and Now. I'm live at the opening gala of the St. John's International Women's Film Festival here at the Avalon Mall. Lots of people here to see tonight's feature film, Black Conflux. And joining me now is the writer and director of that film, Nicole Dorsey. First of all, congratulations. And uh, what's it like to be opening the film festival this year? Oh, it's incredible. We were here last year shooting in September. So to come back and premiere the film, in uh, in St. John's, it feels like a homecoming for the project. Yeah, and you have, uh, you're not from here, but you do have a bit of a special connection to this province, right? Absolutely. My mother's father uh, and family down the line are all Newfoundlanders. We actually, her siblings are here tonight that came. So I traveled here back in 2010, originally shot a film in 2014 and was back for the feature in 2018. So tell us what Black Conflux is about. Um, so it's this unconventional coming of age tale about a teenage girl named Jackie and a young man named Dennis whose lives eventually cross. Uh, it's this, this sort of psychological dark drama um, set in 1980s Newfoundland. 1980s, around the same time when the Women's Film Festival began. <laughs> exactly. So again, feels like this lovely, uh, this lovely homecoming connection. Yeah. Yeah. I saw the trailer for the movie, and it looks pretty dark. Yeah, it definitely has a bit of a dark edge to it. But I also think that it's this universal story of being a teenager, and also a lot of timely motifs within the film as well that lend itself to a lot of reflection and discussion after. And some Newfoundland actors uh, involved in the film too, right? I have an incredible cast, a lot of Newfoundlanders, uh, Rhiannon Morgan, um, oh, there were so many, now I'm going to blank on everyone's name, Alexis Coding, uh, uh, Manuel was here too, wherever she is. Um, it's, yeah, it was pretty incredible, pretty special. You know, you're a, a young woman, a writer, a director. What's it like for you kind of breaking into this world of film these days? Um, I mean, I've been at it since I was quite young and went to film school after that and continued making uh, short films over many, many years. So it's, uh, it's always felt like it was part of me. It never felt like an unusual thing for me to be a part of. Uh, so yeah, something I've always gone after. Well, congratulations on uh, your film opening the festival. And uh, yeah, I hope you have a great night and that everyone loves your movie. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. Well, that's it for me here at uh, the opening night for the St. John's International Women's Film Festival. I'm Carolyn Stokes for Here and Now. Thanks, Carolyn.
Okay, well, let's take a look at what's uh, in store because uh, I noticed a lot of stuff on social media about uh, something approaching. Yeah, we got a little bit of a storm, a little bit of a storm approaching uh, over the next 24 to 36 hours. So we'll take a look. Uh, Environment Canada has already issued a few warnings. Uh, right now we have wind warnings along the west coast. So the Rec House area will likely see winds uh, around 130 kilometers per hour. Uh, or more starting tomorrow afternoon and then we do have those wind warnings extending up through gross morn and uh, those areas that are prone to those easterly winds may see gusts upwards of about 100 kilometers per hour tomorrow. Uh, and then we have a special weather statement in effect for eastern portions of the Avalon. So the rain will move in late tomorrow and uh, continue through the day on or at least the first half of the day on Friday. We could see uh, accumulations upwards of about 30 to 50 millimeters of rain by the time that's all said and done. So here's that low approaching. You can see those winds or at least uh, the rain starting to make its way towards the southwestern portion of the island by the time uh, just after the supper hour and then continue to spread across the island overnight. And with that, those winds will do the same thing. Now, this system is quite large and it's not really going anywhere over the next couple of days. So uh, we are going to see a big push of warm air as we start to get into that southerly flow. So those temperatures are certainly going to climb as we head through the day on Friday. And then as that low sticks around, we start to wrap around some of that colder air. So up through Labrador, we're seeing a little bit of snow in your forecast uh, over the next couple of days. Otherwise, it does look like we'll stay with generally gray skies uh, through Saturday, even into Sunday in most cases. So here's a look at your Friday. Here's those temperatures I was talking about. 16 degrees for Cornerbrook, 18 for Grand Falls, Windsor. Should hit 16 degrees uh, for the St. John's area. And then stay with that cooler air up through Happy Valley, Goose Bay. Lab City, you're stuck in those temperatures as well, sitting around 2 degrees through the afternoon. Let's take a look at the next five days. So once we get that warmer air out of the way on Friday, unfortunately, those temperatures are going to dip into Sunday. Again, I have that rain pretty much sticking around uh, into Sunday. Saturday and Sunday we will likely see a few peaks of sun in the mix and then 10 degrees for your Monday. For uh, Central, you're looking at about uh, 8, 17, 18 degrees for your Friday. And then again, that sun coming out more than likely at some point in the afternoon on Saturday and Sunday and then sitting around 10 degrees for your Monday with a little bit more sunshine in the forecast. Uh, by the time Saturday and Sunday rolls around for Western Newfoundland, you're looking at uh, temperatures dipping to about seven degrees and then uh, Monday as of now looks like nine, but those overnight lows dipping back down. They're starting to move down as, uh, as we head into next week for Eastern Labrador, generally single digits. Uh, Saturday, slight chance, or not slight chance, but there's a pretty good chance we'll actually see some uh, wet snow in the forecast, especially in those overnight uh, periods. And then for Western Labrador, looking like we could see some accumulating snow for Friday, certainly uh, some flurries into Saturday around two degrees. And then we're going to continue with that by the time Monday rolls around a little bit more of a wet snow. So that's a look at your forecast. I'll have your weather photo coming up. Thanks, Ashley. In national news, 30 people suspected of running an elaborate fraud and sex trafficking ring across the country have been arrested. Police have laid 300 charges. The investigation started a year ago in Ontario after two victims escaped and went to the police. They are controlled uh, emotionally. Uh, they're controlled through violence, through threats of violence. They're controlled uh, some with uh, drugs and alcohol um, and they're manipulated and uh, psychologically uh, beaten down on a daily basis. A third of the charges relate to sex trafficking. Police believe many of the 30 victims were from Quebec and that the suspects used violence and threats to control them. The other 200 charges relate to illegal guns, drugs and fraud, many of which involve several Western provinces. Police say the group was organized and its leader was one of the men who was arrested Police expect more victims to come forward. Well, over the course of the election campaign, they've become familiar faces as they show their support for what and who they believe in. They knock on doors, they lead volunteers, and some even run themselves. So who are we talking about? Well, significant others, of course. Hannah Thibodeau has more. 
They're in the spotlight and wield power. No, not the leaders, their spouses. And times have changed. These spouses are different. I don't ever feel like I'm playing a role or that I'm fulfilling a role as the wife of. Justin Trudeau's spouse, Sophie, attends many events with her husband. Hello. And when she's not traveling with Trudeau, she stands in for him. So you've been out there campaigning. What else have you been doing? Door knocking. I've been going into different candidates' offices. She also helps manage tough situations, like when the photos of her husband in black and brown face emerged. Life has tough moments, so when it gets tough, you actually it's an opportunity to show what you're made of and to, and to rise above. I know who my husband is, I know who we are, and I think Canadians know as well. It's not always easy, but um, I, I enjoy the role of support person and I, I try to help as much as I can and be there for him. Conservative leader Andrew Scheer's wife Jill says attacks on social media and negative headlines are what makes it stressful. We FaceTime the kids and just bring it back to our normal lives and talk about things that are topical and and things to do with the kids. It just sort of changes the channel and just kind of lightens the mood. One, two, three, she helps him kick back. One of Andrew's assistants has one of those speakers and we hook it up on the bus and we have dance parties. Does Mr. Cher have dance moves? <laughs> not really, no, he's pretty, not so much a dancer. Gurkir and Kaur is one of Jagmeet Singh's closest political advisors. I'm his partner, so naturally you want to chat with your partner about how the day is going or if there's certain events that, you know, were frustrating or if it was a good day. So in those conversations, you're going to want to give the best advice to someone I believe should be our next prime minister. Hey, welcome home. Huh? She's playing a big role in his campaign in Burnaby South, recruiting volunteers, entering data and canvassing. John Kidder is the man beside Green Party leader Elizabeth May. The two were married last April. We made a pact at the beginning of this that we would not have more than two weeks separation between us at any point. Kidder still has political ambitions of his own. He's the Green candidate in Ashcroft, B.C. Kidder is also May's finance critic, but says his most important role is to provide emotional support. Our pillow talk is politics, you know. Hannah Thibodeau, CBC News, Ottawa. I think this is pretty much the definition of flat calm. Isn't that pretty? <laughs> A gorgeous shot. Uh, Lynn Allen sent us this photo, and I'll tell you where it's to when we come back.
wind down here and now with something super Canadian. Yeah, and it's something that happened at Tim Hortons drive through no less. This was the scene in Saskatchewan over the weekend. Check this out. Yeah, not the kind of customers you usually see ponying up at the window. Mm -hmm. Very, very large double double there. Uh, the pictures uh, were taken in Rosetown. It's about an hour and a half outside of Saskatoon. That officer there and the cowboy, they had just taken part in a local parade and they decided, hey, let's get a coffee and call it a day. I'd say. See the little kid there? I was actually videotaping on the phone when they go around the corner. <laughs> That's so great. Off we go. <laughs> Looks like a beautiful day for it. <laughs> very nice. <laughs> very nice. Okay, back to the photo. Yeah, another yeah. beautiful day, a little bit closer to home. Take a look at that photo we showed you just before the break. This was and, taken and in Cottrell's Cove. Okay, I was nowhere no, near this one. Beautiful weren't. shot, though. An absolutely gorgeous shot. Yeah, we're getting on to uh, pretty much peak, I think, fall season there. So yeah. Lynn uh, Allen sent us that photo. Thank you so much for sending it in. And if you have any weathers you'd like, weather photos you'd like to share with us, send them to nlphotos at cbc.ca. And thank you so much for watching this evening, and uh, we'll see you again tomorrow evening. Have a great night. Good night.